tonight's talk as a title. And the title is A Sutta Description of Nibbana. Uh, it's not the talk I really want to give. I want to give a description of Nibbana from personal experience, but we just have to go with what the Buddha left. The word Nibbana is literally not burning, not burning with the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion, right? And remember the Upadana Khandas are the blazing aggregates. We want to put out the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion that we have concerning these aggregates. And this cooling out, this chilling out is Nibbana. Now, some people want to make Nibbana like a heaven for people who are fully awakened. Our hot heaven. That's Nibbana. That's not going to work because one of the things we know about Nibbana is that it is unchanging. And if you're not in Nibbana now, and it's an actual place or something, and it ain't going to change to let you in, you're stuck on the outside. And that's not going to work because clearly there were people realizing Nibbana. Nibbana is a realization. It's not a destination. But what are we supposed to realize? Well, thus have I heard. Once the Blessed One was staying near Savati in Jaita's Grove, Anadipindika's Park. On that occasion, the Blessed One was rousing, inspiring, and gladdening the bhikkhus with a Dhamma talk connected with Nibbana. And those bhikkhus, being receptive and attentive and concentrating the whole mind, were intent on listening to the Dhamma. And then on realizing its significance, the Blessed One uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. There is bhikkhus, that base where there is no earth, water, fire, or air. No base consisting of the infinity of space, no base consisting of the infinity of consciousness, no base consisting of nothingness, no base consisting of neither perception or non-perception, neither this world nor another world or both, neither sun nor moon. Here, bhikkhus, I say there's no coming, no going, no staying, no increasing, no decreasing. Not fixed, not movable, it has no support. Just this is the end of dukkha. So this comes from the Udana. The Udana is a collection of 80 suttas, also in the Kudika Nikaya, the same collection where the Sutta Nipate is. And this is Udana 8.1, uh, the eighth chapter, each chapter having 10 suttas. And the word Udana is the inspired utterance. So each of these has a prose section, and then it has some verses. And sometimes the verses and the prose go together. And sometimes they don't have anything to do with one another. Most scholars think the verses are probably older and the prose was added later. But what we've got here is the Buddha saying there is that base. Now remember, the eye is the base of seeing, the eye and sight objects, internal base, external base, ear and sounds, internal base, external base. We could say the, the experience of seeing, right? It, it it's depends on these things. So that experience where there's no earth, water, fire, or air, that experience where there's no infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, or neither perception or non-perception. Right? So this is neither form, the four elements, or immaterial, the immaterial states. Neither this world nor another world nor both, neither sun nor moon. 
Here I say there's no coming, no going, no staying. No decreasing, no increasing. Not fixed, not movable, it has no support. Just this is the end of dukkha. So clearly the Buddha is talking about, well, we could say non-duality. He's saying the opposites aren't there. No sun, no moon, no coming, no going, no staying. It's a little cryptic. What is exactly does it mean? Well, I think we're going to need a little more help than this sutta, but this is something to keep in mind. Nibbana is a place beyond the usual dualities. 8.2. Same introduction, the Buddha is giving a talk on Nibbana and says, it's hard to see the unaffected for the truth isn't easily seen. Craving is pierced in one who knows, for one who sees, there is nothing. Or we could get another translation of the verses. The uninclined is hard to see. The truth is not easy to see. Craving is penetrated by one who knows, for one who sees, there is nothing. For one who sees, there is no thing. What if we step beyond the thinginess of the world? What if we step beyond subject-object duality? Okay, I think that's what the Buddha is pointing to here, but it's, it's hard to see. The truth is not easy to see. And yet it needs to be known in order to penetrate craving, which is what we've got to do to get past the dukkha. Can you experience the world without experiencing things? Yeah, that's really hard. I mean, you look around, there's a whole bunch of things. There's a lot of dualities. There's high and low and long and short. How do we do this? Well, we could take a look at Udana 8.3, which has the same opening. The Buddha is giving a discourse at Sabati on Nibbana. And he says, there is bhikkhus, a not born, a not brought to being, a not made, a not conditioned. Or we could say an unborn, unbecome, unmade, unconditioned. If bhikkhus, there were no unborn, unbecome, unmade, unconditioned, no escape would be concern, would be discerned from what is born, become, made, conditioned. But since there is an unborn, unbecome, unmade, unconditioned, therefore an escape is discerned from what is born, become, made, conditioned. This is probably the most famous description of Nibbana. But the fact that it's famous doesn't make it all that easy to understand what's going on here. Part of it is the translation. There is an unborn and unbecome and unmade and unconditioned. That's eight words. And five of them are wrong. Poor translations. The first thing to realize is in Pali, there are no articles, no a, an, or the. So we got to throw those out if we're going to get a sense of what's going on here. There is unborn, unmade, unbecome. And then unconditioned is an absolutely terrible translation of asankata, asankara. Okay, so the sankara, remember that's that's things that are fabricated or concocted. And so this is a past participle, so fabricated or concocted. And then the ah at the beginning, not fabricated, not concocted, unfabricated, unconcocted. Unconditioned sounds like Nibbana is a thing that's not dependently originated. And yet here we are practicing and the ultimate 
into practice would be the realization of Nibbana. So that realization certainly arises from the practice that we do. So it would seem to be conditioned, right? So that's why I say it's a terrible translation, but it's unfabricated, it's unconcocted. I think what the Buddha is saying here is recognize the unconcocted nature of the world, the unfabricated nature. We are the fabricators. We see what's out there and we chop it up into bits and pieces. We give it its solidity. There's the table here. I can't show you a picture of it because if I tip my screen down, it'll just turn off my computer. But yeah, you can hear there's a table here. But the table is what I call it. You know, if I was a leprechaun, I'd probably think of it as a bus shelter. I mean, it's just about the right height. But it's really the history of some dead trees. When I look at the table, can I see the trees that existed that were full of birds and sunshine, rain, minerals in the earth, that was all part of the trees. And then the trees were cut down and milled into the wood and made into this table. And then in the future, it's gonna wear out someday, right? And then it'll, well, I guess be firewood. Of course, if there's a flood and this comes floating by, it might be a life raft. The tableness isn't in the object. It's something we're imputing into it. And it's that way with every object. And in fact, when we're carving the discrete objects out of the holistic universe, it's happening up here. Now, it's not arbitrary that I make this a table and make that my computer, and this is the lamp and so forth. That's not an arbitrary division. It's a useful division. And there are yeah, things that we can talk about, the physics that would make the division seem quite reasonable. But in all cases, when we make these things, we're missing the bigger picture in that all of these things arise dependent on other things. It's just this giant unfolding. I think I said already that there aren't any nouns. It's just that some verbs move kind of slow. Well, truth be told, there's only one verb, unfolding. The universe is unfolding, but we don't even have to say the universe. There's just unfolding, but it's bigger than our pea brains can handle. So we got to chop it up into bits and pieces. And then we like some bits and pieces and we don't like other bits and pieces and we're craving to get some more of these bits and pieces and craving to get rid of those bits and pieces and we just set ourselves up for, for dukkha. So what the Buddha is saying is, can you realize that we are constructing all these dualities? Can you realize that we're constructing we're constructing the things of the universe when there is actually no thing other than, of course, the entire universe. It's, well, the truth is hard to see. So how do you get there? Well, it turns out there's a sutta that has some pretty good instructions in it, also found in the Udana. This is Udana book one, Sutta number 10, the Bahia Sutta. Thus have I heard, once the Blessed One was living in Savati at Jaitis Grove on a Dependicus Park. At that time, Bahia of the Bark Cloth was living by the seashore at Supaparaka. He was respected, revered, honored, venerated, and given homage, and was one who obtained requisites of food alms, food, lodging, and medicine. So he was a holy man. 
and he's living at Super Paraka by the seashore, which I think is probably over towards Mumbai, Bombay, that area. Now, while he was in seclusion, this reflection arose in the mind of Bahia the bark cloth. Am I one of those in this world who are arahants or have entered on the path to arahantship? He's doing his spiritual practice. Is it working? Then a deva who was a former blood relation of Bahia of the bark cloth understood that reflection in his mind. Being compassionate and wishing to benefit him, he approached Bahia and said to him, you Bahia are neither an arhat nor have you entered the path to arhatship. You do not follow a practice whereby you could become an arhat or even enter the path to arhatship. Then who in this world, including the devas, are arhats or have entered the path to arhatship? Bahia, in a far country, there's a town called Savati. There the blessed one now lives who is an arhat, a fully awakened one. That blessed one, Bahia, is indeed an arhat and teaches Dhamma for the realization of arhatship. Then Bahi of the bark cloth, profoundly stirred by the words of that deva, then and there departed from Supaparaka. Stopping for only one night everywhere along the way, he went to Savati, where the Blessed One was staying in Jaitis Grove, on a Tipindicus Park. Now, sometimes you see this mistranslated, that he went there in a single day and a night. But that's a mistranslation. He wasn't magical. He was just determined. And so he traveled all day and then he stopped for the night. And then the next day he got up and he continued traveling and he stopped for the night. And he never rested at any one point and spent two nights in the same place. He just went as fast as it was possible for him to go all the way to Jaitis Grove on a Tipendikas Park. When he arrived, he saw a number of bhikkhus that were walking up and down in the open air doing walking meditation. Then Bahia of the bark cloth approached those bhikkhus and said, where reverend sirs is the blessed one now living, the arhat, the fully awakened one? We wish to see that blessed one who is an arhat, a fully awakened one. The blessed one Bahia has gone for alms food among the houses. He's gone into town to get something to eat. He's on alms round. Then Bahia hurriedly left the Jeta wood. Entering Savati, he saw the Blessed One walking for alms food. Pleasing, lovely to see with calm senses and a tranquil mind. Attained to perfect poise and calm, controlled, a perfected one. Watchful with restrained senses. On seeing the Blessed One, Bahia approached, fell down with his head at the Blessed One's feet and said, teach me Dhamma, O Blessed One. Teach me Dhamma so that it will be for my good and happiness for a long time. Upon being spoken to thus, the Blessed One said to Bahia of the bark cloth, it is an unsuitable time, Bahia. We have entered among the houses for alms food. You see, if a spiritual teacher got his food by going on alms round, it was not a good idea to go interrupt his alms round and ask for teachings. Because if he stopped to give you a teaching, then when he resumed his alms round, there might not be any food left. So you just didn't do that. Upon being spoken to thus, Bahia said for the second time, it is difficult to know for certain, Reverend Sir, how long the Blessed One will live or how long I will live. Teach me Dhamma, O Blessed One. Teach me Dhamma so that it will be for my good and happiness for a long time. A second time, the Blessed One said to Bahia, it is an unsuitable time, Bahia. We have entered among the houses for alms food. A third time, Bahia said to the Blessed One, it is difficult to know for certain, Reverend Sir, how long the Blessed One will live or how long I will live. Teach me Dhamma, O Blessed One. 
Teach me Dhamma so that it will be for my good and happiness for a long time. Now, sometimes if you ask the Buddha really nicely, three times, he might grant your wish. And the Buddha replied, herein, Bahia, you should train yourself thus. In seeing, let there be only seeing. In hearing, only hearing. In sensing, only sensing. In cognizing, only cognizing. In this way, you should train yourself, Bahia. For Bahia, when you can do this in seeing, merely seeing, in hearing, merely hearing, in sensing, merely sensing, in cognize, merely cognizing, then Bahia, you will not be with that. When Bahia, you are not with that, then Bahia, you will not be in that. When Bahia, you are not in that, then Bahia, you will neither be here nor beyond, nor in between the two. Just this is the end of Dukkha. Now through this brief Dhamma teaching of the Blessed One, the mind of Bahia of the Bark Cloth was immediately freed from the taints without grasping. How did the Buddha know to give this particular teaching to Bahia? Somebody he'd obviously never seen before. Well, the clue is he's wearing bark cloth clothing. The commentaries tell us he was wearing the bark cloth clothing because he was washed ashore at Supaparaka naked when his ship sank. And so to cover his nakedness, he grabbed some bark and covered himself up. And people thought he was a holy man. Oh, look, he's wearing bark. He must be holy and started giving him food. He thought that was a pretty good gig. And so he fashioned bark cloth clothing. You got to watch out for these commentaries. He was wearing bark cloth clothing because he was a follower of the Brihad Aranyakar Upanishad. The Upanishads were some early teachings, some of which predate the Buddha. And the Brihad Aranyakar Upanishad not only is very early, but it makes a big deal about trees. So Bahia is dressed like a tree, and it marks him as a follower of the Brihad Aranyakar Upanishad. If you see some guy walking down the street and he's wearing an orange bed sheet and his head's shaved, you're going to go Buddhist monk. You're going to know, right? Okay, you see a guy wearing bark cloth clothing in India at that time, you know, follower of the Brihad Aranyakar Upanishad. And in the Brihad Aranyakar Upanishad, it says, in seeing, there's an unseen seer. In hearing, an unheard hearer. In sensing, an unsensed sensor. In cognizing, an uncognized cognizer. This is your soul, yourself, your Atman. And the Buddha goes, no man, in seeing, it's just seeing. In hearing, just hearing. In sensing, just sensing. In cognizing, just cognizing. He took a practice that he knew Bahia had been doing, looking for the seer in seeing. And he says, no, it's just seeing. That's all that's going on. Basically, he gave him a teaching on not-self. Can you see seeing as opposed to see things and one who is seeing things? You, you sort of got to let go of the subject to let go of all the objects. And so can you just see seeing and hearing and sensing and cognizing? If you can do that, you won't find a self in those things, you won't find a self in here. You won't find a self in between. Just this is the end of Dukkha. And Bahia woke up. Then the Blessed One, having instructed Bahia with his brief instruction, went away. Not long after the Blessed One's departure, a cow with young calf attacked Bahia of the bark cloths and killed him. This seems to be a common hazard at that time. Uh, quite unfortunate. It's 
sort of like drunk drivers today. Yeah, he was coming home from the Sangha meeting and some drunk driver T-boned him at an intersection and killed him. Except, of course, they didn't have drunk drivers in those days. They had cows with calf. They didn't fence them in. I mean, you're walking along. Over here, you see a cow. Over here, you see a cow with a calf. You walk between them. Turns out this calf belongs to that cow. Boom, dead. This was a common hazard. Not only did it happen to Bahia, it happened to the former king of Taxila. The king of Taxila heard about the Buddha and renounced his kingship and left Taxila to go find the Buddha and become a monk. And on his quest, he eventually came to a potter's shed. And he spent the night there with another monk. And this monk gave him a discourse. And the discourse was so profound that one, the king of Taxila realized this was the Buddha, and he reached the third stage of awakening. And he apologized for not giving enough deference and then asked to become a monk. And the Buddha said, do you have your robe and bowl? And the king said, no. And the Buddha said, go get a robe and bowl and come back and I'll make you a monk. Because if you're a monk, you can't go shopping to get a robe and a bowl. You can't even ask anybody, hey man, can, can you give me a robe and a bowl? You got to do this as a lay person. So the king of Taxila sets out to get his robe and bowl, but he's killed by a cow with calf. Oh, well, at least he got to the third stage of awakening. And then there was Supa Buddha the leper. He was walking along one day and he saw a large gathering of people and he thought, oh, maybe it's a distribution of food. And he went along to see what was going on, but no, it was just somebody giving a talk. But he sat out in the back to listen to the talk. Of course, it was the Buddha and the Buddha's talk was so good that Supa Buddha the leper arrived at the first stage of awakening, stream entry. But he too was later killed by a cow with calf. There was a general in King Pasanati's army. King Pasanati was the king of Kosala. His capital was Savati, where Jetas Grove on a Dependicus Park is. And a general in his army was also killed by a cow with calf. It could be anyone. Now, the commentaries tell us all four guys were killed by the same cow, which is rather ridiculous since Bahia's in Savati, the king of Taxila's in Rajagaha. I mean, there's this cow wandering all over northern India looking for these four guys to kill. Well, that's what the commentaries say. The commentaries say in a previous life, these four guys were friends and they hired a prostitute. And after they had had their way with her, instead of paying her, they killed her. And now they've been reborn and she's been reborn as a cow who's out seeking revenge. Yeah, you've got to watch out for these commentaries. <laughs> yeah, it's just a hazard at the time. And poor Bahia got killed by a cow with calf. When the Blessed One, having walked for alms, food, and sabati, was returning from alms round with a number of bhikkhus, on departing the town, he saw that Bahia of the bark cloth had died. So at least Bahia got to enjoy his arhantship long enough to get out of town. Seeing this, he said to the bhikkhus, Bhikkhus, take Bahia's body, put it on a litter, carry it away and burn it, and make a stupa for him. Your companion in the holy life has died. Very well, reverend sir. And so the bhikkhus did exactly that. And afterwards, they came to see the Buddha, saluted, sat down at one side. Bahia's body has been burned, reverend sir, and a stupa has been made for it. What is his destiny? What is his future birth? So the Buddha was frequently getting questions like this. So-and-so has died. What's their future birth? So they want to know about Bahia's future birth. And the Blessed One uttered this Udana. Where neither water nor yet earth, nor fire nor air gain a foothold, 
There gleam no stars, no sun sheds light. There shines no moon, yet there no darkness reigns. When a sage, a Brahmin, has come to know this for himself through his own wisdom, then he's freed from form and formless, freed from pleasure and from pain. Now this sounds a lot like the first sutta we looked at. Four elements, here it's, they don't gain a foothold. And here lightness and darkness aren't there. Again, lack of a duality. And the freed from form and formless, freed from pleasure and from pain. Once again, pointing to the non-dual nature of the universe. To truly experience it, going to have to get with no self there, no self here, no self in between. And the practice is the Bahia practice. I'd recommend that you do this while going for a walk, not some place where you have to navigate your way back or watch out for tree roots, but where you can just walk along. And then can you open your attention as you're walking along and just see seeing rather than objects? I mean, it won't, it won't be steady. I mean, you just sort of step back and it's just, you see the visual field as opposed to the objects in the visual field. And you lose it and you do it again. And when there's a sound, you just hear hearing rather than the bird or the truck or whatever it is. You're just hearing hearing. And as you're walking along, you're sensing tactile sensations as opposed to sensing walking. Right? You're just open there, walking along, and you're not fixating on the objects. You're, you're just experiencing the field in which you're sensing things. That's all. This is the practice to do. Right? It's a little bit difficult, but it's worth playing with. There's another sutta that addresses this. This is in the Long Discourses. This is Dignikaya number 11, the Kevata Sutta. Kevata was a lay person who lived in Nalanda, which is just north of Rajagaha, where King Satu lived. Kevata comes to the Buddha and says, Venerable Sir, this Nalanda is a very prosperous place. You could obtain a lot of alms food and robes and lodgings from these people. You should send some of the monks into town to perform miracles. And the Buddha says, no, that's not how we do this. There are three miracles. There's the miracle of the supernormal powers, walking on water, flying through the air, being one, becoming many, being many, becoming one, appearing and disappearing, diving into the earth, passing through walls and ramparts unimpeded, mastery over the body as far as the Brahma realm. But everybody knows that if you have a Gandhar and charm, it's quite easy to do that. So if I send some monks into town to say, fly through the air, walk on water, wouldn't an unbeliever go, oh, they've just got a Gandhar and charm? Yeah, I guess probably so. The second miracle is knowing the minds of others. But everybody knows if you have a Matika charm, it's very easy to read people's minds. So if I send monks into town and they'd start reading people's minds, wouldn't an unbeliever go, oh, they just got a Matika charm? Yeah, probably so. No, the only miracle that counts the third miracle is the miracle of instruction. And what is the miracle of instruction? A Tathagata arises in this world, teaches the Dhamma. Someone hears it, gains faith, goes forth, keeps the precepts, guards the senses, is mindful, content with little, abandons the hindrances, practices the jhanas, gains insight, overcomes the asafas, putting it in to dukkha. Now, that's just comes to an end there. It's like, it's like, again, this is a sutta that has two actual discourses stuck together. Because what follows next is a complete 
totally different topic. And the Buddha says, Kevata, once in my dispensation, there was a monk who wanted to know where the four elements cease without remainder. And so that monk attained to such a great degree of concentration that he was able to go up to the lowest of the heavens, the retinue of the four great kings. And he went up to those devas there and said, excuse me, sirs, please, can you tell me where the four elements cease without remainder? And those devas said, we don't know. You should ask the four great kings. So that monk got even more concentrated so that he could go up to the next level to the four great kings. And he went to the four great kings and he asked, excuse me, sirs, can you please tell me where the four elements cease without remainder? And the four great kings said, we don't know. Ask the devas of the Tushita heaven. They might know. So that monk increased his concentration and went up to the devas of the Tushita heaven. And he approached them and said, excuse me, sirs, can you tell me where the four elements cease without remainder? And they said, we don't know. You should ask the devas. You get the picture. Up and up he goes through the realms, every time being told, we don't know, ask the guys upstairs, until he gets to the retinue of Brahma. And he goes up to those devas and he says, excuse me, sirs, can you tell me where the four elements cease without remainder? And those devas said, we don't know, but you should ask Brahma. He knows everything. Well, where can I find Brahma? Uh, nobody knows where to find Brahma. Well, how am I going to ask him? Oh, if you're patient, uh, he'll show up. Well, how will I know when he shows up? Oh, don't worry. You'll know. There'll be a bright light and a sound like rolling thunder and the sweet, sweet smell of incense. And he will announce himself. So that monk went and sat in the corner and meditated for a while. And pretty soon there was this bright light and this rolling thunder and a sweet, sweet smell of incense. And Brahma appeared and announced, I am Brahma. I am great Brahma, creator of the universe, Lord of all. I know everything. I see everything. And so that monk went up to him and he said, excuse me, sir. Can you tell me where the four elements cease without remainder? And Brahma replied, I am Brahma. I am great Brahma, creator of the universe, Lord of all. I know everything. I see everything. The monk said, I didn't ask you who you are. You already told me. Where do the four elements cease without remainder? And Brahma said, I am Brahma. I am great Brahma, creator of the universe, Lord of all. I know everything. I see everything. Look, would you just stop repeating yourself and tell me where the four elements cease without remainder? And then Brahma took that monk by the arm and led him away. He said, these guys think I know everything. I don't know where the four elements cease without remainder. But by the looks of you, you're a Buddhist monk. You should go ask the Buddha. He probably knows. So as quickly as a strong man could extend his arm and draw it back, that monk disappeared from the highest of the heavens and reappeared on earth and went to see the Buddha. And he went up to the Buddha and saluted, sat down at one side and said, Venerable Sir, where did the four elements cease without remainder? And the Buddha replied, Monk, once upon a time, seafaring merchants, when they set sail on the ocean, took on their ship a land-finding crow. When they could not see land themselves, because they'd been blown off course, they would release the bird. The bird would fly to the east, the south, the west, the north, flies up and to all the direction. If it sees any land, it goes that way. And the sailors know which way is land. But if it sees no land, it returns to the same ship. In the same way, monk, you've been as far as the Brahma world searching for an answer to your question. And not finding it, you've come back to me. But monk, you have not asked your question properly. Instead, this is how the question should be asked. Where do earth, water, fire, and air no footing find? 
where are long and short, small and great, fair and foul, where our name and form totally come to an end? And the answer is, where consciousness is signless, limitless, and all illuminating. That's where earth, water, fire, and air find no footing. There, long and short, small and great, fair and foul, their name and form totally come to an end. With the cessation of consciousness, this all comes to an end. All right, so this is, this is curious. I mean, it's reminiscent of the Udana after the Bahia Sutta, and it's reminiscent of what we found in Udana 8.1, about the four elements not finding a footing. They're not destroyed, but they don't find a footing. It's the dualities that come to an end, the long and short, beautiful and ugly, great and small, and nama rupa, name and form. Materiality and mentality come to an end. And that place is where consciousness is signless, limitless, and all illuminating. What does that mean? I think that's a description of Nibbana. In Nibbana, you aren't chopping the world up into bits and pieces. You're not experiencing solids, liquids, gases, and energy. You're not experiencing tall and short, high and low, beautiful and ugly. You're not experiencing mentality or materiality. There are no signs. There's no characteristics that you're latching on to. It's almost like you are seeing only seeing, hearing only hearing, etc. And it's limitless. There's no boundaries to be found. You know when you experience that, it's like this forever. And because of that, it's all illuminating. You understand this is the way everything is. This is the whole of the universe. This may still seem a little obscure. So I want to share with you something from the Zen tradition. This is from The Nothingness Beyond God by Kitaro Nishida. Kitaro Nishida was a 20th century Japanese philosopher, a Japanese Zen philosopher. And he says, pure experience is the beginning of Zen. It is awareness stripped of all thought, all conceptualization, all categorization, and all distinctions between subject as having an experience and as experience as having been had by a subject. It is prior to all judgment. Pure experience is without all distinction. It is pure no-thingness, pure no-this or that. It is empty of any and all distinctions. It is absolutely no thing at all. And yet its emptiness and nothingness is a chock-a-block fullness, for it is all experience to come. It is rose, child, river, anger, death, pain, rocks, and cicada sounds. We carve these discrete events and entities out of a richer yet non-distinct manifold of pure experience. This is what Nibbana is. This is the realization. This manifold of pure experience out of which we carve all the things of life. Now reread this. Pure experience is the beginning of sin. 
It is awareness stripped of all thought, all conceptualization, all categorization, and all distinctions between subject as having experience and experience as having been had by a subject. It is prior to all judgment. Pure experience is without all distinction. It is pure no thingness, pure no this or that. It is empty of any and all distinctions. It is absolutely no thing at all. And yet its emptiness and nothingness is a chock-a-block fullness. For it is all experience to come. It is rose, child, river, anger, death, pain, rocks, and cicada sounds. We carve these discrete events and entities out of a richer yet non-distinct manifold of pure experience. When we experience something, we experience it through our senses, contact. And that produces Vedna. And then we conceptualize it, Sanya. We get a handle on it, a name. We distinguish it from other things. Remember at the end of the Kevata Sutta, it said, with the cessation of consciousness, all this comes to an end. The word consciousness is vijnana in Pali, vijnana, which literally means divided knowing. With the cessation of divided knowing, all of this comes to an end. And you're just experiencing pure experience, exactly what the Buddha told Bahia to do. I think I mentioned already in this course, if I had to summarize the Buddha's instructions, it would be, don't be fooled by your conceptualizing. Sanya, that's the middle of the five aggregates. The contact, eh, you leave your senses hanging out, they're going to get contacts. And that's going to produce Vedna. The first time what the processing of this input is really under your ability to control in any ways is the sanya step, the conceptualizing step. Don't be fooled by your conceptualizing. The quarrels and dispute sutta that I talked about, with, I was talking about dependent origination. Remember that? The last bit, someone asked, and how does form come to an end? And the Buddha replies, with conceptualizing, that's not ordinary, not abnormal, not ceased, and not of what has ceased. Indeed, conceptualizing is the source of papancha, mental proliferation. So basically what the Buddha is telling us is try and experience the world prior to your conceptualizing the world. See what's there prior to your concepts. If you can do that, <laughs> then there's nothing there for you to do craving and clinging around because you've got to conceptualize it and then think about it and decide this is worth craving this is worth clinging to. Can you step back far enough and just see pure experience? Big task, but yeah, worth playing with. So play with the instructions to Bahia. See if you can just see seeing as opposed to seeing objects. <laughs>